thank you all for coming. This is the second uh, of, of the year, the, se the second um, CMCI One College Colloquium. My name is Andrew Calabrese and I'm a professor in the Department of Media Studies and Associate Dean for Graduate Programs and Research in CMCI, the College of Media Communication and Information. We're here virtually at the second colloquium of this academic year, and with each of them, we plan to address significant questions of racial justice as they relate to the study of media communication and information. This evening's event is very special because it will highlight the work of Jennifer Ho, Professor of Ethnic Studies Boulder, not the founding director, the director of CU Boulder's uh, Center for the Humanities and the Arts. Um, but before we get started, it's my pleasure to introduce CMCI's founding dean, Professor Lori Bergen. I also want to thank Dean Bergen for her financial support and moral support for this colloquium and uh, for the idea of a one college uh, series and her ongoing support of a great deal of the other research and creative work that happens here in CMCI. Thank you, Lori. Wow, thank you, Andrew. And hello, everyone. It's really great to have you all here tonight. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second CMCI One College Colloquium. Um, that's focusing on racial justice. So as you know, uh, our colloquium series is one of several ways that the college supports interdisciplinary conversations and engagement within our college, but also across the campus and across the university and beyond. So as you also know, uh, since the spread of COVID-19, anti-Chinese and anti-Asian harassment has been on the rise globally. So Jennifer Ho's analysis of recent and historical incidents has furthered national conversations on the climate of racism. And Angie Chuang also has extensive experience in these topics and brings a news lens to the discussion. So I'm excited that you're all here. Thank you for joining us tonight to learn from Jennifer and from Angie. And they are using a format that um, they're calling a conversational interview. So let's let them begin. Okay, so uh, just a, a really quick, uh, it, it's also, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer Ho, uh, who, uh, on whose steering committee I serve for the CHA, uh, and I'm also a past fellow of the center, and even more special for me is that Jennifer was a member of the dissertation committee of my daughter, Emma, who got her PhD, where Jennifer used to teach at uh, the University of North Carolina in uh, Chapel Hill. Jennifer joined us in 2019. Uh, her research focuses on Asian American literary and cultural studies, intersectionality, critical race studies, anti-racist theory and practice, praxis, and contemporary American multi-ethnic literature. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce Angie Chuang, a uh, professor of journalism and a wonderful colleague here in CMCI with whom I've enjoyed working to make important decisions about who gets scholarships for academic achievement. And she's also the recipient of one of our DeCastro grants for her own research. She's an award-winning journalist who spent a big chunk of her career in the uh, Pacific Northwest. And she joined us in August, 2017. Jennifer and Angie have planned a brilliant conversation just for you this evening that I think will be wide ranging and will center on issues of anti-Asian racism as it's manifested in our culture. And I think um, they'll also be discussing how we can make some progress in response to these problems. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to the two of you. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you so much, Andrew, and for uh, Lori and CMCI, for supporting this important um, gathering and this important work. And for all of you for coming um, in week 15 of the semester. I know it's, uh, it's a big deal to make time at, um, at this time of year. And to Jennifer for joining us here in CMCI. Um, I, I should just start because it's gonna come up anyways, but Jennifer is not only a colleague and somebody I greatly admire as somebody who studies race and um, Asian American issues, but um, we've, uh, we met maybe about um, a year and a half ago and recently got to know each other in part because of planning this event. And uh, we've since learned that we have amazing personal connections from growing up in the East Bay area. So I'm just gonna leave and we'll, um, they will probably come up um, organically because it is a conversational interview, but that will be 
that's the tease for um, sticking with us to find out what our, our um, zero degrees of separation are that we've since, we've since learned about. So with that, I think that's a, that's a good segue into, um, I really wanted to first offer you some materials that um, um, Jennifer has um, very thoughtfully put together. And so they're gonna show up in our um, Q&A chat box um, from, there we go. And so these links, and I'll just point you to specifically the first PowerPoint, which will be kind of a roadmap for our conversation. It's Jennifer's presentation about the history of and definitions of um, racism and anti-Asian racism, and then some other supplemental materials that will be um, referenced in our, in our talk today. So please feel free to refer to them now or um, on your own time, um, and, um, and I think they'll be helpful. So where I wanted to start, um, I, you know, we all sort of started on a personal note about our interconnections, but I wanted to start that way because that is really how Jennifer starts her presentation, because the subject of racism and race is both misunderstood and often personalized. Um, and it's very hard for us to um, view race from a distance when it's applied to our own positionality or um, our own views. And that's why it becomes difficult. And so with that in mind, I just wanna ask Jennifer to talk a little bit about how you come to this work and where your background and your professional and personal experiences fit into this work of anti-racism and, um, and studying Asian American history in the United States. Thank you for that, Angie. And um, thank you everyone who's in the audience. I took a quick scan of the participant list and I see some of my current students and a very close and dear friend who's in the audience uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts. Shout out to Dr. Kim. Um, and yeah, you should, you should try and ask us questions about our late 80s, 90s Bay Area family connections. They're pretty, it's pretty wild. Like if, um, what, it, what was it? We started by saying like, if we had a shared autobiography, the name of our shared autobiography would be like, you know, no degree of separation or, you know, I, someone has to jog my memory about what that was, which, which is really a per, perfect encapsulation. And I have to say, um, so Angie, what you just said about race and racism being personal and yet systemic racism is so, is so un impersonal. That was a realization um, that you helped me to see when we were pre-planning in our discussion. And I think for that reason, it's, it, that's one reason that I always try and start any professional biography that's given of me either in print or when I do talks by announcing to people that I'm the daughter of a refugee father from China and an immigrant mother from Jamaica whose own parents are immigrants from Hong Kong. The practice of doing this began in January, 2017. So if we think back to January, 2017, and I'm gonna invoke electoral politics right now because quite frankly, it's public record how I vote. It's probably pretty evident how I vote. Um, and I say that not because I want that to color how any of you receive me, but just to be transparent. And so in January, 2017, then newly inaugurated Donald Trump enacted the Muslim travel ban. And so for those of us who remember that, that wreaked all sorts of havoc in the world. Um, and, and deeply havoc in people's lives. And a colleague and a friend of mine in the English department at UNC, who's the daughter of Eastern European immigrants, said, look, we should, for those of us who have these immigrant ties, which quite frankly should be everyone except for indigenous people, we should really announce what they are, right? We should be changing our biographies and announcing what our ties are to immigrants and refugees. And so from that idea, I started to do that. But the other reason for me to do that is I do come to this subject area, not just from my professional credentials, having done a PhD, having written books, having taught in the subject matter for decades now, but also because I 
experience the world as an Asian American woman, which means that I am subject to micro and macro aggressions related to racism, sexism, and the intersection of racism and sexism. So in other words, when someone is rude to me or calls me names, it's a little bit unclear sometimes, are they reacting to me as a woman, as an Asian American, or really probably both as an Asian American woman. Um, and the reason this is a, um, a conversational interview is because I wanna know what Angie thinks about this. You know, I, I'd love to know Angie, like how, how have you tried to navigate life both on C. Boulder's campus, because you came here two years before me. So you've been living and working the life of an academic in person. Because I got to say this too, right? The pandemic yeah. has really upended my own sense of things. Like I, I'm still, even though I've been here since August, 2019, I still feel like I'm learning about CU Boulder because I've spent more time remote than I have physically on campus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I would just start by um, um, sharing a little bit of my own family's immigration history, which is, and I also want to add that we will have formal Q&A um, at about the hour mark, but please, if anything we're saying um, generates thoughts or questions, we do welcome them and we will um, either um, take a look at them or um, consider adding them into the conversation. So don't feel like you have to sit on your hands while um, while we have this original part of the conversation. Um, we'd like this to be free flowing. And um, so I am a first generation American um, and my parents came from Taiwan um, with, um, with the um, passage of the Hart Seller Act in 1965, right out of um, the Civil Rights Act. And that is important because it was the first time immigration quotas were deliberately changed to allow immigrants from certain Asian American countries. So if people ever wonder why a lot of primarily um, educated immigrants um, who were aimed at graduate school fellowships or jobs in the sciences um, arrived at that time, it was a very deliberate change in US immigration policy. And it was the first time quotas were relaxed outside of Western Europe. And so it really changed the face of immigration. But the fact that there even needed to be a law that had a goal in mind of increasing the um, US ability to compete with um, the Soviet Union in, um, in the sciences and engineering um, was an indication of the prior biases and the prior discrimination that existed in, in the immigration system. So, um, so my father came for education. He was from a poor family in Taiwan and this was like his one chance to elevate his family's social standing and, um, and you know, make great sacrifices to come here. It's a very, very familiar story of many people of my generation. And, um, and I think just that era also begat um, one of the um, tropes that we're gonna talk about, which is the model minority myth, which is the flip side of the coin of the perpetual foreigner. And so I think I will leave that there and then also say, um, I think I have some points um, later in the conversation where I can talk a little bit about my own experiences as an academic, um, but that a lot of my initial exposure to how I um, interacted with the public came in my career as a professional journalist. So I was a reporter for um, three to four, depending on how you count it, different um, daily newspapers um, for about 13 years prior to entering academia in 2007. And being public as a newspaper journalist was an entirely, um, at the time, the only way I knew how to be public, but an entirely vulnerable position in communities where, um, where um, it was not the norm to have a large Asian American community. So I reported in Portland, Oregon. I reported in um, Hartford, Connecticut. And um, that um, visibility, right, um, was, definitely an experience that I wasn't used to coming from the East Bay area, the East San Francisco Bay area like you did. But um, I think we can um, circle around to that in a little bit because I, um, I think that a good place to start is um, as we um, really zoom in on Asian American racism, no pun intended, um, that, um, that if we really are to talk about what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
um, as we see in your presentation, you have to really go back into history and not just the history of how Asian Americans were treated when they arrived in um, the United States, but also, um, also um, many other um, non-white groups. And so I think you've given a great summary in that presentation. And I think I'd just like to invite you, Jennifer, to take um, kind of a step back into the past and see how we can um, trace the roots of the kind of anti-Asian racism and the kinds of tropes that um, we've been confronting for many decades um, to, um, to um, earlier American history. Yeah, thank you for that, Angie. So um, I, I think one of the things, because I've done several workshops on the topic of anti-Asian racism, especially as it's manifesting during the COVID-19 pandemic. And something that I think people don't realize is that there has been a very long history of anti-Asian racism starting in the 19th century. In fact, um, the, the whole idea of the category of Asian American is really forged out of racism. So one place to also start when we talk about race and racism, and this gets back to your point about it being intensely personal, is that we all have racial identities and those racial identities are intensely personal to us. But the flip side, if we think about race and racism as a coin, they're, they're co-joined. You can't actually separate out race from racism. So we all have this personal feeling about our racial identities. And then the flip side of that is, categories like Asian American are created out of racism, out of, out of this flattening of people that we put into this category of Asian. And when we think about who's in this category of Asian, I mean, we're talking about people from over 30 different nations. You know, so if we start, start in the West and we think about um, West Asians, right? From Oman, from Jordan, from Syria. And then we move East across South Asia, right? India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Mongolia, you know, China. I mean, if we look at the USSR and you think about um, people from Kyrgyzstan, people from Kyrgyzstan look Chinese, right? They, they're kind of, I would say, visually indistinguishable from people who live in Western China. Um, and then you get to, and then we haven't even talked about Pacific Islanders, where, you know, those issues are really much more akin to issues of sovereignty than they are maybe to the category of Asian American, and yet we've created this AAPI category. And so to understand what's happening now with Asians, be primarily East Asian, right? Those who could be mistaken for Chinese being attacked and blamed for COVID-19, we have to understand yellow peril rhetoric, which again, begins in the 19th century, begins with the first wave of Chinese. And so just two pieces of, of history to really get into our heads about this. The Page Act of 1875, which is the first time that the United States singles out a group by gender. And in this case, it's Chinese women. So while they're not named specifically in the act, they are singled out and they're singled out for, for not being allowed to enter into the United States because Chinese women are believed at this period of time to be diseased and immoral. And the reason they're believed to be diseased and immoral are that they are often um, sex workers. They're prostitutes who have been trafficked into the Bay Area in San Francisco. So they, I mean, and this is a very old story and it's a story that is still happening. Women are tricked into sexual servitude. They're sold into sexual servitude. They're told there's a job working as a domestic servant. They arrive and then they're told that job disappeared. And by the way, we have your passport. And by the way, you owe us all this money because we transported you here, we fed you. And the only way for you to pay us back is to have sex with men. And so sometimes these women, these Chinese women were held in literal cages and they um, serviced up to a hundred men, both Chinese and non-Chinese, primarily white men. So of course, if you're in these conditions, you're going to be diseased and you're going to be malnourished. Same thing with Chinese men. So the 1882 Exclusion Act is the first time that the United States decides it's going to single out a specific race of people. And race in the 19th century was coterminous with nation. So Chinese were considered a race separate from Japanese or Filipino in this time period. Um, again, we're talking about a situation in which Chinese men are barred from living in certain parts of San Francisco. So, um, 
and their rents are very high, higher than with white men. So you have 10, 12, 20 men living in a single room. Hygiene is very poor. Nutrition is very poor. Disease is going to be rampant. Again, this is not unique to, to the Chinese, but the association of Chinese and disease gets solidified and it gets, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, not glorified, but kind of, and, and this is, I guess, I, I think also relevant to CMCI, right? The press plays a role in this. Public perception plays a role in this. Pamphlets, um, political pamphlets play a role in all of this. So that this association of Chinese slash Asians with disease and immorality carry over into the 20th and 21st century. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think just, uh, um, I think probably most of us who have studied US history have seen um, the political cartoons of the era and a lot of the newspaper coverage that routinely depicted this very, um, this very stereotypical, very offensive, um, you know, buck tooth, um, slant eyed, um, um, usually Chinese man. And there's many, many of them that depict this sort of like um, anonymous, like nameless row of them kind of invading the United States. There was kind of like an idea that they were vermin or they were, and the whole, um, a lot of the editorials of the day talk about how they're stealing white men's jobs, that there's labor shortage and we can't. Um, and at the same time, um, there are um, newspaper accounts sort of um, celebrating Leland Stanford of Stanford University, but also of um, the Trans-Pacific Railroad um, being really clever because he decided that it was better to import Chinese labor than try to use African slaves because he believed that they would um, work harder with less resistance and put themselves into more dangerous situations for very low pay. And that's the very beginning of the stereotypes of the compliant docile model minority also mixed with the yellow peril stereotype. And I think that brings us into, I mean, I think the irony to me about Asian American history in the United States is that when we talk about this racism, it's the government doing it with the assistance of the mainstream media. So it's not necessarily just um, casual racism or racism in the population. And that it sort of rotates from group to group. And so at first the Chinese are targeted because they were brought in as this labor force because of um, where um, China was at, after, especially Southern China after the opium wars and how, how devastated the country was and how they had this need to push people out for, um, for jobs or for um, some kind of um, um, meager financial existence. And then, um, and then as the Chinese were literally um, federally excluded, then the attention turned to the Japanese as we moved into World War II. And so I think there's a couple other um, key events on, um, on um, Jennifer, on your timeline that are um, worth bringing up and then moving into how different Asian American ethnicities sort of um, get to rotate being in sort of the national crosshairs, right? Or in, into being the um, problematic group of the time. Right, and have never left, right? So, yeah. so if we think especially, um, I'm glad you're jogging my memory too about, about part of what we had discussed in our pre-meeting. Um, I, think, I think if we think about 9-11, that's actually such an important moment when um, South Asian, Muslim, Arab Americans get lumped into a category that people are kind of loosely thinking of as terrorists. And, and we can think about what's happening now in the political sphere with um, Lauren Boebert and um, Representative Ilhan. Um, and this kind of back and forth that's happening where, you know, Representative Boebert is acute, you know, is kind of making these not so veiled Islamophobic um, anti-Muslim comments about Representative Ilhan, you know, somehow looking like she might be a terrorist because of wearing a backpack. And um, that is something that South Asian, Muslim and Arab Americans face to this day. And, and interestingly, this isn't as talked about, I think, with respect to anti-Asian racism, because um, I think the place of South Asians within the category of Asian American is one that hasn't always been um, readily seen, embraced, understood. Again, I, the category of Asian American is so broad 
um, that it, it tends to flatten differences and it tends to also kind of make assumptions about like Asian Americans are those, you know, you know, Angie who look like us, right? Who have East Asian features versus those who are um, West Asian or South Asian. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the um, phrases, especially people in our parent immigrant generation, they would say things to me like, nobody in Asia is Asian American or is Asian, right? No, nobody in China and Taiwan in uh, India, North India, South India, it, um, would say, I am Asian. That is a completely American identity that has its roots in activism of the 1960s. And the idea that we're creating a pan-Asian identity because one, there's power in numbers and there was a need for groups to come together practically. And two, because we're often lumped together anyway, so why not leverage that um, that perception to um, political and activist advantage. And so it, it is a very American conception, but it tends to either flatten out or mask some of the, or a lot of the diversity within what we call Asian American Pacific Islander groups. And I think um, just um, when, when you bring up 9-11, I can't help but to think uh, a lot of people don't make this connection because we don't relate um, West Asians or, or um, people of Muslim descent with East Asians, but um, the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II certainly had so many of the same tropes and much of the same um, media phrasing and stories about national security, about um, sort of leveraging the population to be wary, to be on the lookout. You know, if you're on the plane and the person is wearing certain clothes, you have to be careful and uh, point them out to people. And the equivalent to that is um, there was a Life magazine cover in the early 1940s that was about, it was a diagram of how to tell Chinese people apart from Japanese people with like terribly racist drawings um, so that you could distinguish who might um, literally be a terrorist, right? They, they might not have used the word terrorist, but a spy, um, a traitor. And it was ironic because after years of being legally excluded, of being, um, you know, the um, the problem and the enemy, suddenly it was better to be Chinese and being Japanese in uh, World War II was was being the enemy. And so you look at how media has perpetually sort of reinforced these ideas and um, and um, and really created. Um, um, helped create um, Asian America as a concept, both sometimes sometimes positively, but very often negatively. And so I'm curious, um, as we, um, we've been using um, the idea of yellow peril and um, perpetual foreigner interchangeably. And there's sort of a flip side of that called the model minority. So I was, I was really interested, Jennifer, in how you would describe how those two ideas sort of emerged um, out of World War II and um, why the Japanese American incarceration was such an important moment in, in defining how Americans view um, Asian Americans. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I feel like there's, there's so many questions I just want to also ask you or the audience, right? Because some yeah, of Yeah, yeah, please, please. Um, well, yeah, I don't, I don't want to derail and I don't want to not answer your question, but I mean, one of the things, Angie, when you were talking about like that, that infamous Life magazine, I mean, and, and for those of you at home, you should Google Life magazine. Um, I mean, unfortunately it uses the word Jap and I, I apologize for, uh, for repeating um, a specifically ethnic racial slur, but that's actually what the Life magazine title is, right? How to, I think it's how to spot a Jap, literally is the name of this really awful, really racist thing. I, I think it's worth Googling and, and seeing how a mainstream magazine, well-respected, treated this as if it was serious, um, as if you really could tell, right? As serious science, with, instead of this kind of strange racist pseudoscience that we now understand it to be. So it sort of begs the question about the role of media and journalists um, certainly during World War II, but I think we could ask ourselves now, right? To what degree are, are media figures reporting news versus creating knowledge 
that is then used in service to things like the Japanese American incarceration. You know, because again, what you mentioned about the role of the government, I mean, all of this um, is connected. They're not, they're not separate. How the government reacts to public perception, how public perception is created through the media is deeply interconnected. And I think the Japanese American incarceration is, you know, has been and will always be a hallmark within Asian American history because this is when, um, you know, it didn't matter how long you were in the United States, you were seen as this enemy. You were seen by dint of your blood, right? Again, this is the language of World War II, by dint of your Japanese blood, you could not be trusted. You were like the, you were like the enemies and yet, German Americans and Italian Americans were not treated this way. Now it is true, German national men and Italian national men, particularly those that had ties to two German and Italian international political groups were also incarcerated along with Japanese men who had ties to Japanese nationalist groups. And they were put into a particular detention center, I believe in Montana. Um, but the only group that was singled out men, women, children, including those of mixed race, were Japanese. Those are the, that was the only group targeted wholesale for incarceration, um, regardless of whether they were US citizens and two thirds of those incarcerated were US citizens. And then you fast forward again to 9-11, people want to um, do the same thing to Muslim Americans, regardless of the length of time that they have been in this country. And Sikh Americans are the most misidentified Muslim Americans, right? Non-Muslim non people who are continually misidentified by others as being Muslim and therefore on the receiving end of some pretty violent, fatal hate. Um, and, I, and I wanna mention, I mean, I think, and now I'm ping-ponging all over the place and then I'll, I'll stop after this comment. So we've talked a lot about Atlanta um, and you and I have both written pieces in the conversation and, and they're, in, they're part of those links that um, Amanda sent in the chat. Um, and Atlanta was a watershed moment, I wanna say for the nation in terms of really kind of waking up to, to the ways that um, Asian American lives, particularly Asian American women's lives were made very precarious, both during COVID, but then due to this history of um, yellow peril, hypersexualization of Asian women. Two weeks later, there's a mass shooting that happens in Indianapolis. And I, I know for those of us in Boulder, I mean, it was just trauma after trauma. You had Atlanta, a week later, the King Super Boulder shooting. A week later, Atlanta, at, um, sorry, Indianapolis. Now the Indianapolis shooting, I think did not get the same attention as the Atlanta mass shooting. It was sort of chalked up to being like a disgruntled employee of a FedEx center. What news outlets didn't, what mainstream news outlets didn't report on was the fact that that FedEx facility had 90% employees who were sick American, who were South Asian. Now, the Sick Coalition and other Asian American media outlets did report on that, but I don't think it was treated in the same way that the Atlanta shooting was, which again kind of begs the question about what is being reported in mainstream media versus more specifically ethnic media markets. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope, I mean, I think what, when we, um, when we talked about this in our, um, in our uh, rehearsal talk, um, I think what really blew my mind is just how the interconnection of the PAGE Act, the association of illness and um, Asian women being forced into sex work and that, and the perceptions of, um, of the spa workers in the Atlanta shooting who were not confirmed to be sex workers. It was not necessarily a given that that's why they were there. The shooter clearly had that in mind and that became this little trope, but that the women were sort of, I think dehumanized and categorized before um, people really had a chance to learn about them. And that the portrayals of the women came slowly because of language barriers, because of, um, distrust in the communities, but we really had a kind of, I think, um, collapsed shallow understanding of the victims, which then tends to dehumanize um, all Asian Americans because this is how Asian Americans were visible 
in, in the news. But I think as we trace this history, I'm seeing so many threads of that coming together in this history. And then we get to the illness factor. And that's sort of why COVID was, um, was um, I think um, both treated and framed and described the way it was in relation to China and the Asian American community. I mean, I don't need to repeat some of the phrases that, um, you know, even the president was using like the Wuhan flu and Kung, Kung flu, I think was one of the ones. Yeah, that one, that one is pretty undeniably racist, right? Yeah. We, can, we can all agree. Hopefully we can all agree that was pretty undeniably racist. Yeah, yeah. And I just yeah. wanted to, I know, I know we're like, um, we're um, treating this very non-linearly, but I think this is how Jennifer and I tend to, tend to converse. And so I hope, I hope this isn't too, uh, too difficult to follow for people, but I think it is about the interconnections across history. And it really is that, um, you know, past is prologue and is present and that we're seeing these patterns repeat themselves and they're not, and they're not um, vestiges of a racist past. They are part of our present. And um, you really took me back to this. I was a, um, I was a staff writer at the Oregonian in Portland, Oregon when 9-11 happened. And um, one of the first stories I did uh, Portland, Oregon has a large Japanese American community in part because many of them were interned near, um, there was a large farm community. Many of them were uh, forced out of their farms and interned inland. They didn't want anyone near the coast. And as they returned, they set up communities around Oregon because of the locations at which they were interned. And, um, and that community um, very quickly after 9-11, as the hate crime started, um, got together, reached out to the Muslim American community and started this series of meetings over dinner and at mosques where they were saying, we are gonna teach you everything we learned from World War II so that you can avoid what happened to us. And I found that both so devastatingly sad and so moving in so many ways that those were some of my um, favorites, not really the right, word, but as a journalist, they were some of the most compelling stories to me of seeing how these communities came together um, on their own in the wake of 9-11. Yeah, so, I would yeah. I would say, you know, the um, the two communities when I think about their solidarity work are Japanese American and Sikh Americans. Um, I mean, there's a really a long and lengthy history and tradition. Um, I think for Japanese Americans, it's really borne out because of the Japanese American incarceration. I think for Sikh Americans, it's born out of their faith. Um, but again, these are two, I want to say, F Asian ethnic communities. Um, I, although I, I want to also say I recognize that Sikh is a religious affiliation rather than an ethnic affiliation. So while it is true that I think the majority in the United States of Sikh Americans are South Asian, certainly one can practice Sikhism without being South Asian identified. But you know, there's a wonderful organization called Suru for Solidarity. Um, and they um, will fold crane, they fold cranes and they hold demonstrations around ICE facilities. So they've been really, you know, not just around issues of racial targeting, um, although one could argue that uh, going to an ICE detention center is a, is a matter of racial targeting, but they really have been active as a Japanese American founded organization in wanting to fight for racial and social justice and solidarity with other groups. Um, and, and it's, you know, I think, again, you know, thinking about race and racism, and I know there's actually, there's an interesting question in the q and I don't know if we want to take it now. Oh, yeah, please. But I, I think yeah. that um, partly this addresses the question in the Q&A around how do we combat racism, right? How do we address anti-Asian racism in particular? So, um, do you want me to read the question, Angie? Or yeah, do you absolutely. Want to read the question? I'm sorry, okay. I was looking at the wrong place and I didn't even realize we were getting <laughs> questions. This is exciting. So yes, please. Yeah. I, I, and I'm we, so we happy have, to hear from the audience. And yeah. by the way, we have, I love the fact, I just noticed there's also a comment to the question. So I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I love it. Please. encourage other people to please use the Q&A function for dialogue and conversation. So yeah. the question that we received is many Asians also prefer to differentiate themselves of other non-Asian Americans by saying Asian American to recognize their subculture. For instance, France does not have labels of race plus nationality. 
Yet there's a push by people of color and Muslims, especially African and Arab, to want to include these labels separate from themselves from white French people. If we adopt the logic that adding Asian American is racist, what would be alternatives? Should we follow French, the French and not recognize subcultures? Um, and there's also a comment that I think is worth yeah. reading. So there's a comment from a listener who's saying, I wonder if the lack of specificity regarding the most populated continent on the planet is the real sticking point here. For example, using Japanese American versus Korean American helps break up the American tradition of considering Asia a monolith and helps encourage a sense of nuance. So interesting about France too. Um, I have some thoughts, but do you Please, want to take I, I would love to hear what you think about this. So, I mean, first of all, talking about race and racism are very localized phenomenon. For the students of mine in this room, they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, Jennifer Ho, our professor says this all the time. And it's really true though, right? And it, it, it speaks to Angie, what you were saying about your mom, right? That there, there are no Asian Americans in Asia. That term is absolutely meaningless, really, outside of a very specific US context. So, um, I mean, even taking a place like Canada, which, you know, for a, a lot of people in the US, they think of Canada as being sort of, you know, just US adjacent, this US adjacent state for my Canadian relatives, they're, you know, they have a very, you know, distinct culture, and they're very proud of that culture, and they do not want to be considered a subculture of the US. Um, so how we talk about race and racism in the United States can really only be understood in the United States. I will say as a recent Colorado transplant, the way that I understood race and racism operating in North Carolina does have different nuances than here in Colorado and is different than the way race and racism are understood in California, even though we have this shared national identity. So to be able to talk about race and racism in the United States as any as applicable to France, it isn't going to work. France has its own culture of race and racism that will make trying to talk about Chinese French or you know, um, uh, Muslim French people very different than it would in the United States. So I guess how I would answer the question is that I think there's a couple of things that we need to kind of decouple from one another, right? The answer to racism isn't not addressing races, right? So in other words, if we understand race to be a social construct, and it absolutely is, right? Race is not connected to our genes. It's not connected to notions of blood. It really is socially constructed and born out of necessity because of the system of racism, right? This isn't a chicken and egg thing. This is clearly, there's a system of racism that existed in the modern period. And by modern, I mean 15th century. And that system of racism, as we understand it, was really founded out of the transatlantic slave trade that was created primarily by European nations, the United Kingdom, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, right? Those are the kind of four predominant European nations involved in the transatlantic slave trade. In order to justify the dehumanization of enslaving people from one region of one other continent, this being the Gold Coast of, of Africa, Ghana primarily, what we now know I would say is Ghana primarily, Right, so that you're gonna take people from that continent and then enslave them to work on a totally different continent, South America. So I think, in the, again, in the United States, we primarily understand slavery to be what happened in the US South, but actually centuries of enslavement of black people from Africa in South America and Caribbean, in the Caribbean, right? And the United States is, that was kind of more of a, a recent wave, we can say, of the transatlantic slave trade. So. The fact that this is a history that has happened is, is just true. And the way that it has manifested in the United States is what we are now contending with in terms of how we use a language of race and racism. So not referring to myself as Asian American, not referring to black people in the United States as African American or black American isn't going to, um, disrupt systems of racism, right? It, it won't make the transatlantic slave trade go away. It won't make the fact that the United States colonized and settled um, indigenous territory, right? And by the way, we, I am coming to you from the traditional territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations. That's just simply a fact. So no matter what I call myself, the facts of race and racism that exist in U.S. history still need to be contended with. 
I, I went all pedantic and academic. So I don't know, Angie, if you want to bring it back. No, it just, it made me, um, I think um, it made me want to give a uh, fellow journalist shout out to um, Isabel Wilkerson and her book, Cast, which outlines this history, I think, in such a unique way and sort of brings in her own personal history. So if you wanted to add to your, your reading list, that one is, um, is quite good. And I, I think I wanted to address the questions and please keep them coming. These are both great. Um, by um, uh, just clarifying or adding that um, I don't think either of us see the category of Asian American as problematic in and of itself or racist. It's that often the um, monolith or the flattening that happens because Asian American um, comes without an understanding of all the subcultures and ethnicities and the religions um, that can often happen, especially in media, especially um, in public perception, but that I think there's a lot um, of good that has come from the activism, the solidarity, the um, collective, very uniquely American identity of being Asian American. And I think many people find, um, find a lot. And I think the ways I would parallel that is, um, um, right now in uh, one of my classes, we're teaching a unit on disability studies and about how the category of people with disabilities did not exist until the activism around the right to work and the ADA Act happened. And all the people who were once categorized separately by different disabilities said, we're better together and we actually have a shared experience, not because we inherently are the same, but because society has treated us very similarly and that we can find, um, we can find not only um, activist benefits in uh, power and numbers, but also a feeling of um, being able to relate to one another because we've been treated the same way. Um, uh -huh. You can see that in the LGBTQ community as well. I could go on and on about different communities that have come together because of things that might be negative, but found a lot of positive solidarity out of it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. In fact, I have a question for you. So I, when, if I have to really think about how I identify, and, and I mean racially and ethnically, yeah. my primary mode of identification is Asian American. So that's actually what I would lead with personally. I, prim I first and foremost identify as Asian American. And then I would drill down to say that I'm Chinese American and maybe even further than Chinese Jamaican American. Um, and so, and I, I have a really particular reason why that's my identity, but I'm kind of curious how you might identify racially and ethnically, Angie. That's such an interesting question because I think not by any intentionality, but I think it really depends on the situation. And I tend to kind of be interchangeable. And my three would be Asian American, Chinese American, and Chinese American from Taiwan. Mm. And, um, and that's really important to, as you know, to, um, to people um, in our parents' generation to distinguish from um, people from mainland China and people who, um, whose roots are, are in Taiwan and went there before um, the Cultural Revo Revolution. Yeah. So, um, and that's a whole other, whole other uh, ball of historical wax we probably won't get into. And I think for me, um, it often is the context I'm in. And if the person asking me is Asian American, to be totally brutally honest, and also the um, degree to which I sense the person is curious about what my ethnicity is, because I'm sure you get a lot of the, well, what are you? Where are you from? <laughs> and so sometimes I just say Chinese American from Taiwan to preempt that question when I feel the question lingering in the air. And it's like, let me say, let me save you the trouble. You're such a nice person. So this is where we differ, right? <laughs> you're the you're the nicer of the two of us by far because when people want to play that game with me, I I go all in on on what I what I want to answer versus what I know they want from me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in other words, and again, this is the kind of one question I would say that unites most, if not all, Asian people in the United States. At some point, we have been asked where are you from or the more problematic what are you right because what, yeah. like, what are you what does that even oh, and then mean? and then the, the follow-up to that is no no where are you really from where are you really from right where are you really and from? I, I do the resistant version of that is california right <laughs> yeah and then 
and, yeah. and then, then, then it kind of keeps going. Where are your parents from? But I'm curious, you had said that you choose Asian American and I'm curious why, why, um, why that choice? For me, Asian American is, is a symbol of, of social justice. That the term Asian American was, was specifically born out of racial and social justice movements of the late 1960s and 1970s. So the term, I mean, it's rare that you can actually trace back the etymology of a specific racial label, but in the case of Asian American, you really can, right? Two graduate students at UC Berkeley mm -hmm. created the term Asian American, and they created it as an umbrella term to use for political organizing, radical political organizing, I should, I should say, um, during the third world strikes at San Francisco State and UC Berkeley. And I think, in, you know, when we think of history, we think like it all coalesced and we all, you know, we, we can all see it, right? But when you're living it, it's all unfolding and it unfolds over, over like a length of time. And so, you know, it was over several meetings with student activists from um, the San Francisco Bay Area where they thought we need, we don't like this term oriental, you know? We, we don't want to be called oriental and Asian doesn't quite fit either because it's highlighting where we're from rather than who we are and where we're, where we're at. And it was a, a term that they created to say, we want to organize collectively together and to recognize, you know, exactly what you were saying, Angie, to recognize that we are stronger together. We have, we have distinct ethnic national differences, linguistic differences, cultural differences, um, because our ancestors are from the Philippines and from Korea and from China and from Taiwan and from Japan. But what we have in common is this institutionalized systemic racism that we are experiencing as fellow Asians in America. And so we're going to unite and organize with Black, and at the time it would have been Chicano and Native American people, as well as white allies toward empowerment, right? Again, and against the war in Vietnam. I mean, this was definitely yep. a movement Absolutely. that wasn't just also about racial justice, it was, was about, you know, trying to end worldwide violence. Yeah, yeah. really well said. I just want to, um, I'm going to ask Jennifer one last question for this portion. And we have a great question that's like, right after my own journalist heart, um, in the Q&A box that I would like to start Q&A with. And so, um, um, so I, I think what I wanted to end our like conversational interview section with was on a hopeful note, which is, um, you know, one of the things that I, I think we media scholars tend to be really good at pointing out what's wrong. And there's certainly a lot to critique about mainstream media and um, we, get, we get very practiced at doing that. And what I love about your work and um, what you've been speaking out about is that, um, that you've been actively um, creating and promoting um, both yourself and um, with partner organizations solutions and ways in which we can fight anti-Asian racism or we can, um, we can even intervene as bystanders. And so I'd love to hear more about your own work and use that as a sort of springboard forward into what can we do about this? How can we move forward to try to fight some of these trends? And then, um, and then I'm going to jump into the Q&A box because there's so much good, um, good conversation starting there. Well, Angie, it's like you were inside my mind because as you were, as you were talking earlier, I was actually finding the link to the CHA. So I'm going to put, I have this actually teed up. I've had this teed up for a bit. Oh, I didn't even... Okay, I said I had it teed up, but then I forgot the really central thing, which is to give you all the web the website address. And so I think, I think a lot of those materials are on the link to that was given out at the start. But yeah, please, please send it out again. Well, this one is actually, um, so we didn't talk about this one. This one is actually something that the Center for Humanities and the Arts in partnership <laughs> with um, the University of Colorado, Denver, their, their ethnic studies. So shout out oh, to Faye okay. Cronin, who's not on here. So we partnered together and applied for a grant through Asian Americans Advancing Justice, which got which also had partnered with Kaiser Permanente. And what we're doing here at CU Boulder through the CHA is creating a call for arts and humanist projects 
that are address anti-Asian racism. We're gonna give out 10 grants in the amount of $1,000. And we'll also make available $500 in material funds. So for example, if somebody wanted to had this vision for a mural or somebody had a, a vision for a podcast or a film, we would actually have additional materials um, other than the $1,000. So the $1,000 is yours. And then you could apply also for additional money for materials grants for us. And the idea is that we would fund people to address anti-Asian racism who could help intervene in anti-Asian racism. So you need not be Asian American identified to apply. You need not be somebody who is a CU Boulder student, staff, or faculty member, although you could be. This is open to anyone in the greater Boulder, Denver, Colorado area. So we're taking applications through February 1st. Please share this out, especially for the faculty. I know there's a couple of faculty members on this. Please do a screen grab or go to our website. We'd love you to help advertise to students in the room. Um, we've so far only gotten two applications, but it's early, right? Because February 1st is the deadline. Um, would love to see both people apply. Um, of again, of any identity. So, that, so this is the last thing I'll say, and then we can head into the Q&A. So I was, I'm gonna tell a story. I was once, this is back in North Carolina, it's right after the 2016 election. And I am feeling very demoralized. And I'm at a really fancy dinner where I have a billionaire to my left and a millionaire to my right, literally. And I'm at a table of all white, pretty much all white donors. And some, and some staff from the Humanities Center where I was the associate director. And we have this common table topic and the common table topic because it was literally the day after the 2016 election was no matter how you voted, we can recognize that the state, the political state of the nation is very polarized. So what can we do as people who support high, the mission of higher education to address this polarization? So at the table, um, one of the things I mention is that in North Carolina, an hour north of Chapel Hill, there was the local chapter of the KKK was going to throw a parade in celebration of Donald Trump winning the election. And I mentioned this, and I mentioned that this is disturbing to me, that a local branch of the KKK in our north of Chapel Hill is going to, two weeks before Christmas, we're planning a celebratory parade for Donald Trump. And the millionaire to my right says, well, I know that there are Democrats who are in the KKK. Oh, okay, right? Um, so I say to her that that's probably true. There are probably members of the KKK who vote Democrat, right? But that the issue of being somebody who's participating in white supremacy is not tied to electoral politics, right? So in other words, one can vote Republican, one can vote Democrat, one can vote independent and be a white supremacist. In this case, a literal white supremacist of the KKK. But equally true is that anyone can choose anti-racism. So it need not matter whether one votes Democrat, one votes Republican, or one is an independent or one never votes you can decide to embrace anti-racism, but it is a choice. It's, it's a willing, deliberate choice to embrace anti-racism, right? So not being racist and saying racist things and doing racist things is not the same as choosing anti-racism. Choosing anti-racism means you're going to educate yourself about the history of race and racism, and then you're gonna do something about it, right? You're gonna, you're gonna try and intervene in racism. So I think this is the most important takeaway when I do workshops is to remind people the category racist is an adjective. It's not an identity category. And all of us, regardless of how we vote, what our ethnicity is, what our racial identity is, the length of time we spend in the United States, all of us can choose to intervene in white supremacy and racism and to address anti-racism. So I, I hope people will, um, apply to the CHA, yeah. you could get a thousand dollars. And uh, and then maybe we can sneak in uh, 80s references to the gunny sex outlet in San Francisco, Angie. I think the Q&A might, <laughs> might have chances <laughs> for that. But that's, um, that's so great that that program launched and that partnership exists. And I also want to point people, the links I was referring to in the first set of um, materials that were sent um, the second link um, will take you the anti-Asian 
Eight Racism Resources will take you to um, uh, Jennifer's co-created courses. They're um, totally open access online courses on anti-racism one and anti-racism two. And also um, information about um, Hollaback bystander training, which is really about how you intervene when you see um, a micro or macro aggression or an act of violence or um, discrimination in progress. And I guess I would just um, kind of leave us with the um, idea that um, anti-racist is different than not racist, right? That there's an active, um, there's an active positionality there. And it's not simply just saying, I'm not racist, I'm not part of the problem. Yeah. And, um, and um, I'll just plant some seeds for Q&A too. Um, I think some of the things that um, we've been wanting to talk about show up in some of the articles, but the, um, the, um, the problem of the model minority becoming used as a leverage against other minority groups and how that played out in media depictions of anti-Asian hate being um, disproportionately uh, perpetrated by Black Americans, which was a statistical falsehood, but was um, over-exaggerated through the use of cell phone videos. And that's the piece um, that Jennifer wrote that's also on the list that generated tons of controversy for many different reasons, which we could also get into and speaks to the very first thought that she had about um, um, attacks on public scholars as, as Asian Americans. And then um, I would like to take the, um, the first unanswered question because it so speaks to me as a, as a journalist and a journalism scholar. And it was um, about, um, um, how objectivity standards of professional journalism influence public perception of what is news and what is fact. And um, this totally speaks to the conversation, uh, Jennifer, you and I had earlier. So this is a perfect question. And um, a thought experiment I love um, conducting, the, the um, asker says, consists of imagining what the world would look like if we went away from standards of objectivity and had outlets announced from the outset what their loyalties are. How would that have changed public perception of Asian people in the US during World War II. Um, so this is, this is what um, mainstream journalism is wrestling with right now. And I would say not to, there's, you can never pinpoint anything on one event, but I think the event that has really challenged mainstream journalism is the death of George Floyd and, um, and so many other um, um, black individuals at the hands of police brutality. Um, in the summer of 2020, but particularly Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020. During the pandemic, when we sort of had a captive audience, when people were in um, a particularly, I think, heightened and receptive state as, as these protests happened. And you had this generation of very um, uh, younger journalists, many of them journalists of color, who were sent to the protest, because that's usually what happens in the newsroom. The young journalists of color get sent to the protest because they're young and because they blend in easier and might be um, less targeted by fellow protesters, although they were then targeted by police, which was a whole other issue. And then, and then they were asked to um, post about their coverage on social media and have a presence on Twitter. And over and over again, you saw journals of color getting suspended, getting in trouble, being told that they were biased. And over and over again, you saw journals of color pushing back and saying, this is not a two-sided story. This is not a situation in which I am treated objectively and I can only report, um, like the question says, transparently from my position in the world. And that is, that's a question in journalism right now. I think also the era, the post-truth era and, um, and the Trump administration have really challenged the idea of is it really about both sides of the story? Is it um, creating um, a balance between different views? Or is there another kind of factual reporting or truthful reporting that we need to start exploring? And so I think I'm just gonna leave it there because I could go on forever about this. But Jennifer, I'm curious from a non-journalist perspective, um, how, um, how you view this debate of objectivity and the, the nature of facts. 
Yeah, there is so there's so much to dive into. So first of all, thank you for the question. It's a great question. Um, I I do want to really think about the fact that I don't I don't know how to answer without um, really betraying my political affiliations and and whether and how bad that is to betray my or announce my political affiliations. Right. So I've already said that I. Um, that I vote Democrat, I, I, you could probably have guessed that without me announcing that. But even so, I would like to think that no matter how I vote or what my political leanings are, that I understand that there's a bait, like what, what facts are. And the fact that we're living, the, the, the problem is we're living in an era where we cannot agree on what basic facts are. So for example, we, you know, Angie, you mentioned things around race, but, but, and I get asked this question again, when I do workshops, it's like, how do we address racism, right? How do we, how do we stop being polarized? And I said, look, we're in the midst of a global pandemic and we can't agree on public health initiatives. Masks have, have become polarized. So this is, this isn't true in other nations, right? Other, I mean, if we, again, if we look at Asian nations, there's a culture of wearing masks and doing so to, for the greater good, right? I wear a mask when I'm, because I might be sick and I don't wanna get anyone else sick. Not I'm wearing a mask because I don't wanna get your germs, which does potentially help, but the ethos of mask wearing is for others rather than for yourself. That's, that's true within Asian cultures. And that would have been such a lovely, right? Can we imagine if mask wearing had that connotation? You wear a mask to protect other people out of an ethics of care. But instead it's become this kind of politicization of wearing a mask then announces who you voted for. And how, so what do we do when we can't agree on or the results of the 2020 election where that, that, that or vaccine, the efficacy of vaccines, that things that really should be guided by public health and trust in the, the political process. And we've seen what happened in terms of the January 6th insurrection and we can't even agree, right? There are news outlets that want to rewrite history and say that the January 6th insurrection was not an insurrection. Um, and I don't know what to do about that, right? I don't know what to do, you know, so it would be, I suppose, interesting for news outlets to have to announce their, their political leanings or ideology, but I, I guess we already know what they are, right? We know that Fox News has a particular um, ideology. We know that Newsmax has a particular ideology. And some would point to MSNBC and CNN and say that that's the, right, that that's the opposite end of the spectrum. But I'm not really sure if that's true, right? I, I agree that MSNBC might have a particular kind of political bent, um, but I think they're still trafficking in basic facts, whereas I'm not sure what to do about news outlets that aren't trafficking in basic facts. Um, and I want to say one other thing and then, you know, turn it over to you, Angie, and you can either respond or we can go to another question. So I got interviewed recently um, about critical race theory um, by Victoria Reyes. And when we did this pre-meeting, she was kind of talking about, as a journalist, feeling the need to represent the other side, right? So she was interviewing me as a critical race theorist who could talk about race and racism. And she said, well, maybe I need to have some, to balance it out, I need someone from the other side. And what I said to her was, but do you? Because the other side is saying that somehow we should ignore the basic facts of US history. And I'm not sure that that's really another side so much as that's someone who's promoting a particular kind of political ideology that is, is ignoring basic facts. So it's someone who is on the other side of critical race theory is somebody who's more akin to a climate denier. So there are scientists who don't, who, who are legitimate scientists who do not believe that the climate change that we are seeing is, um, is induced by human intervention in the environment. And th those are probably 1%, right? 1% of scientists do not believe that climate change is um, the result of human interaction with the environment. Whereas 99% of climate scientists do. 
So if you're, if you've got a climate scientist who's saying, look, human beings have really messed up the earth because of human interaction. And then you have another scientist who say, oh, no, 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 this is just a natural weather pattern that's happening. You're basically giving 1% of scientists equal weight to 99% of scientists. And that hardly seems balanced. It seems that actually what you're doing is amplifying the voice of a 1% fringe giving them equal weight to the 99% of scientists. And I think that's exactly what's happening with, with race, right? That somehow we're saying the people who, are, who study race are given the same kind of legitimacy as people who wanna say, the critical race theory is poisoning minds of children in K through 12 schools because they're learning about the transatlantic slave trade and that's harmful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I guess I would just, um... There's so much that could said, be said about this. And I would even venture to guess that not all of my colleagues in the journalism department agree with each other. It's not an easy question. But I do think that the, the um, traditional model of a pro and a con, and it's not even that traditional, that sort of evolved out of um, 20, the 24 hour cable news crossfire CNN model, where it was a lot cheaper to put two talking heads who wanted free publicity on air and let them fight with each other than it was to actually go out and report. And I think that's sometimes what we're lacking is the, and this goes into funding models for journalism and the economic crisis that's facing our profession, but that um, we have fewer reporters, um, both um, uh, white mainstream reporters, but also reporters of color and alternative outlets that show views like the sick American view of the Indianapolis shooting. All of those have struggled in the online transition and the pandemic and the current economy, and we have fewer reporters reporting. And I think that's one issue. And I think the other issue is that social media and the fragmentation of media have made traditional objectivity, have really exposed it for how it was once useful but has failed us, and how it is a largely um, white Western American male concept because it is predicated on experts, on science, on the scientific method. And the scientific method, while it has brought us many good things, has also brought us justifications for slavery and eugenics and, um, and a lot of bad science. So that we, um, we really are in a position where this younger generation of Gen Z and millennial journalists who are more diverse than their editors and their bosses are really pushing against this idea of traditional objectivity and saying, can we question it for not a kind of pure concept that um, has only brought us truthful and good journalism, but actually um, has either evolved and become something that is harmful or um, is could stand to be questioned. And so it doesn't, it doesn't leave easy solutions, and certainly the profession is in a lot of turmoil, but that's the current debate that's happening now. And I think that's a really good segue into the question about um, CNN's uh, promotion of Asian American journalists during the height of anti-Asian racism. And this, this speaks so much, and it was about this idea of, is it, is it, um, is it really giving people a chance to have the agency to cover their own issues or is it a kind of tokenism like that, um, you know, describing that kind of uncomfortable visceral reaction of like, ooh, is this okay and is this gonna last? And that really spoke to a conversation you and I had about how we both raced and you really raced, you were like out the, the you were out the next day, which um, is um, major, major uh, journalism uh, deadline props there um, on CNN, um, ironically, um, speaking out and that you and I talked about how we both had this feeling as did so many Asian American scholars and, um, and writers that um, we're not gonna get another chance, that this is our moment. People are listening to us. They want to hear from us. They want to publish us. If we don't all like write our op-eds right now or write our articles now, we'll, ne we'll never have this chance again. And I'm really curious what you think about this question about um, either promoting or thrusting Asian American journalists into the spotlight during a crisis like, let's say, after the Atlanta shooting. 
Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. Um, I, I know the person who asked the question who's a really brilliant scholar of Asian American studies herself. Um, you know, so I I hope it lasts, right? You know, and and so one of the things I was sharing with Angie when we did our pre meeting. Um, so I did a lot of I did I I did a lot of interviews after Atlanta. Um, and I think anyone who knows me on, knows that I'm not actually very interested in self-promotion, but I am very interested in anti-racism work. And as president of the Association for Asian American Studies, I felt a certain responsibility to grab the moment that you're talking about, Angie, right? Because I wasn't sure um, as a question, how long is it gonna last? How long are people, how long are people gonna pay attention to Asian Americans? And so at the end of every interview, Journalists would ask me, and I learned this is a common journalist question, right? Journalists would say, is there anything else you want us to know, right? Is there, is there another question you'd like me to ask? And I always, I gave the same response. And the response I said was, I'd like this not to be the only story you do about Asian Americans. So the one thing I want you to know is that I'm doing this interview with you and I'm glad you're doing this story. I want you to not... I don't want the attention to Asian Americans to falter once the crisis is over. So somehow, right, that there was this, you know, there's this interest in the fact that, oh my gosh, Asian Americans are being targeted because of COVID-19. And then it was, oh my gosh, there are black people who are harming Asians. That's a story. Let's talk about black Asian tensions, which by the way, I, I did six, literally six interviews in a one week period specifically on that topic. And I got so annoyed that I did this long Twitter thread that went viral because the issue of Asian American and black antagonism, while real to a certain extent is also an invented narrative that is promoted in the media um, and that gets promulgated as if it's reality when the truth is it's much more complicated to talk about the relationship between Asian American and African Americans, particularly because there are mixed race black and Asian people. Naomi Osaka, for example, that really complicate this notion of Asian American, African Americans always being in an antagonistic relationship to one another. Um, and so while on the one hand, I think representation matters and it's a good thing and we need more visibility of Asian Americans of all persuasions in various media outlets. Um, I want white reporters to do stories about Asian Americans and black reporters and Latina, Latino, Latinx people and indigenous people. And by the way, Asian Americans should do stories about African Americans and about disabled people and about, you know, like the list goes on and on and on and on. In other words, what we should be thinking about is what's the story we wanna tell that is of interest and that we need to have attention on regardless of whether it speaks to me personally or not, because as a human being who's invested in liberation and social justice, I want to do these stories because I have a vested interest in wanting the world to be a better place. Yeah, yeah. So I, it, it's a both and, right? That I think it was great that Asian American journalists were asked to cover Asian American issues, but it's also important that journalists of all races see that as an important story and are seen covering that just as it's really important to see Asian American reporters covering the White House or covering, um, you know, um, issues in Sudan or, you know, like that this is, it's both and, it's not. And that every journalist is different and every scholar is different in how they want to relate to their personal identity. And there shouldn't ever be any assumptions about, well, you're Asian American, you must, you must um, want to study these issues or work on these issues. And so. Yeah, can, yeah. and I, can I actually tell you a story? So I also, yeah. um, I recently got interviewed by someone at USC's Annenberg School. And um, it was about the rise of Asian American mayors. So, you know, Michelle Wu won the election in Boston. And I think there were two other mayoral races in which yes, Asian Americans yes. won. Yes. And so they reached out to me because I'm president of the Association of Asian American Studies and the reporters was sort of like asking me questions like, you know, but there are so, you know, like, but if there's so few Asian Americans, how could they be a significant voting bloc to vote for this particular mayor? And, and I finally said, you know, we don't always just vote by ethnicity, right? So in other words, I didn't support Andrew Yang. Um, when he ran for president, he wasn't my top pick by any stretch of the imagination. Now I'm not 
trying to be anti Andrew Yang or anti Asian American politician. I just mean I, I voted on a national electoral level based on who I thought had my best interests. Um, and so, you know, there may have been and there may be Indian American voters who voted for Bobby Jindal specifically because he's Indian American. But I know plenty of South Asian and Indian Americans who would never vote for Bobby Jindal because he doesn't represent their political interests. And, and that seemed to be newsworthy of the reporter. She was like, oh, I didn't think about that. And again, it's really interesting, right? That there's a certain assumption that when one is of an eth of a ethnic American background, right? Chinese American or racially Asian American that we're just sort of gonna vote you know, like lemmings, like we're going to just like, oh, Chinese American, I'm going to vote for the Chinese American or, oh, and this kind of speaks to, um, you know, the question of, of popular cultural representations, right? Yeah. Um, yes, I like seeing Asian Americans in popular culture. I think that's a great thing. But just seeing an Asian American in popular culture doesn't necessarily mean much to me politically necessarily, right? I, again, I think I was, I was on another panel where people were saying, we need more Asian Americans in, to run for office. And I said, well, actually, I'm not sure because if all of it, if every Asian American conservative ran for office, I wouldn't vote for them still, right? Um, by the way, I think Yi Chen is, is part of this call and she did this really amazing documentary. I yes. mean, full disclosure, I'm I, in it. <laughs> So that's going to sound thing like we have in common. We both know her. We both know Yi Chen. I mean, that's going to sound like it's self-promoting. And I, I really, when I took part in the documentary, I just thought I was going to be a minor talking head, but it really speaks to, you know, the fact that there are conservative Asian Americans and their political interests are aligned in a very different way than other Asian Americans. You know, we're not a monolith. We vote in a variety of ways. We practice different religions. We speak different languages. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I did want to give a nod to that Asian Americans are having this popular culture moment. And on the one hand, it's exciting. And there's definitely a lot of um, interest and solidarity around Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings and Crazy Rich Asians. On the other hand, there's sort of a feeling of the representations have been so paltry and kind of awful at, at times up until now that anything that's brought into it just feels like um, too little too late or like really it took you this long to, to acknowledge that we exist. And so I think it remains to be seen how it goes. I think, I think it's a positive trend, but um, it's really hard to get excited when we've been so invisible in popular culture or really demeaned and made to be kind of like a punchline or, or a, uh, the butt of somebody's joke. And we're so getting, we have, we have one last like really good question about, um, about the word racist. And I'm afraid it might, um, if you have like a quick, like um, three minute answer to that, and then I'm going to have to transition us to um, Andrew to close out our evening. So I don't know if you want to take the, um, the last question. I do, but I, I did sort of want to talk about Shang-Chi. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the question about like, what, you know, so yeah, calling people racist has become, right, that's been the kind of, and yeah. I've been in those back and forth, right, where yeah. I was like, I think this is, I think something is is racist, and then when I mentioned that, someone's like, you're accusing me of being racist, and that makes you racist, and then you go into this whole back and forth. It's deflection. Yeah. It's, when people do that, it's deflection. Yeah. Depending on the situation, you can say that. You can say, you know, I think what's happening is deflection. Um, I, you know, as much as possible, I think to be, to try and not let your own emotions take over because I know that I, I'm subject to that. And I so when those things happen to me, I try and be calm and say, look, we're talking about systems. We're talking about white supremacy. We're talking about, and so to bring it back to the institutional and to say, this isn't personal. This is about systems. And this is about wanting to redress harm, systemic harm that people are experiencing. So I think that, you know, um, to maybe call it out, you know, as directly as possible, but as gently as possible, again, depending on your relationship with the person by saying, you know, I think you may be deflecting about what the real issue is. The real issue is the, the harm, the racist harm that's happening. So whatever label we, if you're more comfortable by my using the label bigoted or prejudiced or biased, we can use that label, but let's address the systemic harm that's happening. Okay. I didn't like Shang-Chi. I thought I'd love it. and I didn't like it. Did you? Oh, I, have, I haven't watched it yet. Oh, never mind then. Okay. I'm a bad Asian. I'm sorry. 
Yeah. Well, no, I, I think one of my reasons for not liking it, and this won't spoil it because I think you get, is it felt very much like it was just retrograde. If, you know, yeah. so I wanted to like yeah. it, but it, it felt like, okay. And I, I, I felt that way about Crazy Rich Asians too, that it's, it's great that it's out there, but it had like serious problems with its depictions of South Asians or with its like kind of presumptions about, um, about the relationships of, um, of um, the Chinese and wealth in Singapore, where I have relatives and I know, I know a lot about what Singapore is really like. Um, so yeah, and, and again, if it weren't the only thing out there, it would matter less, right? If yeah. there were like 20 Marvel films that featured Asian American heroes, then whatever slightly retrograde uh, concepts would matter less. And I think that's where I have to leave it. Um, and um, I'm gonna pass it on to Andrew, but I guess the, since we kept teasing it, I'll just say that Jennifer and I realized upon like our first couple of weeks of meeting each other, that I went to the um, junior and senior prom with two of her cousins in the East Bay, East San Francisco Bay area, uh, two different proms, two different cousins, and that we never knew each other for 30 years after that happened. So that, that's our weird, that's our weird connection. But, but, the, but the really interesting thing is I had been seeing Angie's face in my grandparents' Oakland Chinatown because apartment. Then I shared my prom picture with her to say like, this is me and your cousin 30 right. some years ago. And it was like, oh my gosh, I know that photo. I've been looking at that photo on and off for years. And so, I mean, that, that's just the tip of the, of the inter, yeah, intersecting. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. We, we'll, we'll have another uh, colloquium about the, the um, late 80s and early 90s in the San Francisco Bay Area. <laughs> uh, thank you both, Jennifer. Thank you, Andrew. And, and Angie, this, is, this was wonderful. Um, and uh, everybody who's still here, thank you. And um, just want to remind you that they're here at CU, and you should you should take their courses, and you should uh, go hear them hear them talk, uh, and you should apply for the grant that uh, that Jennifer announced. Um, I just want I have a uh, just a few really quick thank yous to to give uh, before we we cut out. One is to Liz Skews who. Um, is um, an unsung hero of of uh, the CMCI because she she ran two departments for several years and it was not an easy job uh, and um, we we all appreciate that but more to the point of this event um, this was her idea and uh, so I wanted to thank Liz for the idea and uh, also Melinda Miller and uh, Amanda McManus. Uh, from our communication team in CMCI because they were the ones who um, made this possible, um, the, the, the backbone of, of this event. Um, so thank you all and th thank you again, uh, Jennifer and Angie. Thanks everyone. I, yeah, I really enjoyed the discussion and it's nice to see everyone's notes on the, on the Q&A box and just, yeah, thank you for being here and being a part of the discussion. It was great, yeah. Benning Sachs Outlet, next discussion topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.